uh, my name's Kevin Bell and for the last six or seven years I've been had the privilege and interest of working with industry, um, uh, co-funded by the MLA Donor Company, looking at the position of uh, irrigated fodder in a beef production business in the Pilbara of Western Australia. Now we know that irrigated fodder has a lot to offer and we can see it here. It's easy to grow, it looks green and it looks lush and cattle are used to grazing pasture so it seems a fit but there are a few things we need to know about it and in the, this series of three videos we hope to share a bit of industry experience in what we've observed and learnt over the last six or seven years. There are fundamental differences between tropical pastures and temperate pastures for which most grazing in the world and, and certainly Australia is done. These tropical pastures look very leafy and green and in fact they are leafy and green because what we're standing in here is how we would like to have a pasture when cattle first go into it to graze. The reason for this is the tropical pastures are never going to be as digestible and there are as temperate pastures and they are, there are big differences in digestibility of leaf and stem, not much more than in temperate pastures. So when cattle come to graze a tropical pasture, they are going to select and they will always select for leaf. And that's why we're introducing them to a pasture like this, because we don't see too much stem and leaf is what we want. In fact, I've heard one farmer say, leaf is beef. He's right. When cattle come to eat this, it's been shown, demonstrated conclusively in Australia and, and worldwide that the biggest influencer of weight gain is, is bite size of leaf. That as much as cattle can get as much leaf into them in a bite as they can. Now what stops them eating is the digestibility of the pasture. It looks green, it is green, it looks lush, it is lush, but it has a lot more fibre than our rye grasses and clovers and other grasses. And that's what stops cattle, limits their intake. So if we're going to graze the, the pasture, which is an expensive resource up here, we have to get it, do it as efficiently as we can. It, it's no good just putting them out there, grazing it laxly, um, too much, too little. It affects the pasture, it affects the cattle weight gain. And the, the, the utilisation of this pasture can vary from 20% to 70%. And obviously it's, it's a relatively expensive resource to produce and maintain, therefore we have to use it properly. And the cattle's weight gain is what gives us the, the income. And so we have to present that pasture so the cattle have the opportunity to take in the biggest amount of leaf in a day that they can of high quality pasture. pasture what can we expect cattle realistically to gain per day what's the average daily gain because we hear of cattle gaining 0.8 1.1 kilo grazing oats and ryegrass and more well we found pretty consistently over many years now with a lot of control weighing and measuring of pasture that we can expect cattle to eat about 2.4 to 2.5 percent of their body weight each day of, part of this pasture and that's that's the limit of their intake under good grazing management. So it's a bit more for younger cattle as a percent of their body weight, a bit less for older cattle as a percent of their body weight. That sort of weight gain normally means about 0.6 of a kilo a day, which doesn't sound a lot, but eating, for example, for a 250 kilogram heifer or steer, six kilograms a day of dry matter, so many megajoules, 0.6 of a kilo for a 250 kilogram animal. Now, it varies within breeds. We found that with uh, Drought Master Cross, a little bit more, um, a, a little, with Wagyu, a little bit less, uh, mainly because their, 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 their appetite is less, um, their feed conversion rate is, is not so good, but yeah, for, for the, the, the cattle of the north, about 2.5% of dry matter of pasture per day. Now, that's under good management and of fairly good leaf, and the, the limitation is the fibre. 
the NDF, neutral detergent fibre. And that, that 2.4, 2.5% of body weight equates to about 1.5% of an animal's live weight in NDF. And that's the stopper. No matter how green, no matter how lush, literally it's a matter of room and time. You can eat fibre, you can eat stem, and it, the animal has to stop, takes extra time to digest it before it goes again. So that's the expectation. So we have to manage it to get the best out of this seemingly limited situation. The best pasture options for direct grazing and stand and graze systems we found are the subtropical and tropical pasture varieties. So here at Skewthorpe we have a research site, it's just outside of Broome, and we have a random, randomised replicated trial which we cut every month for two years. And in that trial we had seven species of C4 subtropical and tropical grasses and that in, included 12 different varieties. And we cut that, uh, we got tw 23 um, harvest data sets from that trial. And the outcome of that was that the Rhodes grass and the Panic grass varieties were the clear standouts, which um, is, reinforces what industry is already growing. Um, and the benchmark production for those systems is 100 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, which means that over a year we're expecting to get between 35 and 40 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So some of the other species that we tried in the trial were um, too tropical for this environment and they basically shut down and stopped growing over the dry season and they were just not competitive against um, other subtropical grasses that came into those plots um, such as the Rhodes grass and the Panic grass which just really took over. There's a few differences between Panic and Rhodes grass. Um, Panic grass is really great because it's a very leafy grass and it's highly palatable to cattle, they love it. Um, but it is a bunch grass, so it doesn't spread by stolons and you have to get the establishment right when you're putting it in. Um, and it can also over time get quite lumpy in the paddock, so if you're driving machinery over it, it can be a little bit more bumpy than Rhodes grass. Rhodes grass is a spreading grass, so it will fill in the gaps if it's not seeded super densely. Um, it does have not the greatest reputation for feed quality, but it can be really good and comparable to panic grass if it's managed well. And the important thing is that it's kept leafy and not allowed to get tall and stemmy, as that's when the feed quality really drops because it's got that higher fibre content. Irrigated fodder with the resources of water, and you may or may not have to pump it, there's a cost there. It has phenomenal growth, therefore it needs a lot of nutrients which you have to supply, and they come a long way. And it takes quite a bit of labour. We found it takes, wherever you go, about one labour unit per two pivots per 100 hectares. And there's a bit of equipment has to be run, maintained and depreciated. So ballpark figure. Um, I'm finding about $5,000 plus per hectare per year to grow about 35,000 kilos of dry matter. Now we can bring that back to with the figures of what a cattle eats and gains weight on. It can be anything from do it well and it's $2.50 a kilo, do it average it's $3.50 and have a few mistakes it's $4.50 a kilo to put on um, a kilo of beef. So the, hence management, hence we're, influ we're trying to emphasise the importance of getting grazing management right. If we choose to graze, it has to be good to make it worthwhile. In irrigated fodder production, nitrogen fertiliser is one of the most significant input costs. So here at Skewthorpe we designed a randomised replicated trial to evaluate different rates of nitrogen and see how it affects production. 
We had five rates of nitrogen plus a control, and they were one, two, three, four, and five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per day. We cut this trial every month for two years, and again, we have 23 data sets, like harvest data sets. So what we found is that the response to nitrogen in terms of dry matter production plateaued between two and three units per hectare per day. As you'd expect, the protein content continues to increase as the nitrogen rate increases, but again, between two and three units per hectare is adequate levels for growing cattle, apart from very young cattle. So under this trial, we have nine lysimeters, which are large drums buried a metre below the soil surface, and they catch any water or dissolved nutrients that leach past the root zone. And we can pump that water out and test it and look at the um, nutrient losses from this system due to leaching. And to date, we found that with those um, suitable rates of nitrogen, we're not seeing any nitrate leaching because we're matching the nutrient requirements to the rate of crop production.